so this is basically the definition of we can say a general overview of the tort that it is a civil wrong and for which so good morning students my name is vishal and i am a faculty of rutas is so in today's lecture we will be discussing certain points regarding law option so students we know in the mains examination a student has to opt for two options two options there are two option papers and there is one option subject so the students have been provided with a variety of choices to opt any of the subject regarding law i'll be this holding discussion regarding certain points so the law optional exam include two option papers of 250 marks each so cumulatively they form 500 marks <clears throat> and the thing is the law optional is a scoring subject not too many students opt for law obviously students do, those are having law as background they opt for law optional so there are two papers and the syllabus of the subject is relatively moderate it is neither too voluminous and neither too low so today i'll be discussing what are the important subjects that are included in the paper 1 and paper 2 of the law optional and i'll be discussing about one issue or we can say one part of the or one topic of the subject so in paper 1 as we all know we have the subject of constitutional and administrative law and the second portion is the international law or we can say the public international law so these two subjects cumulative can fetch you 250 marks because obviously they count for 250 marks so the weightage of constitution and weightage of <coughs> international law it is distributed evenly in the first paper so second paper consists of subjects like law of torts law of crimes contract law and then we have certain minor subjects or minor laws such as the sales of goods act the negotiable instruments act then we have the environmental protection act then we have the various developments regarding pil that is the public interest litigation then we have <clears throat> the various modes of pil or various modes of alternative dispute resolution so all of these minor minor <coughs> minor laws they basically you expect at least one question from these minor laws so now after summarizing all these i can say we have five major subjects one is constitutional and administrative law second one is in public international law then we have the law of crimes so now basically we have to study the bharatiya nyay sahita earlier before the repealing of ipc we have to study ipc fortunately for the students in the second paper there is no procedural law we only have the substantive law fortunately you don't have to study the bulky crpc or the now bnss or the CPC. So, <clears throat> the law of crimes only constitutes the IPC, former IPC, or now the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, that is BNS, and <clears throat> the law of contracts and the law of torts. And we have certain minor laws, as I've told you, the Negotiable Instrument Act, the Sales of Goods Act, the Environment Protection Act, <clears throat> the Prevention of Corruption Act. So, cumulatively, you can expect at least five to ten questions from. these minor acts so today i'll be holding discussion on one topic from the subjects of from the subject of law of torts the students who are from the law background the students who have done their bachelor's and master's in law they must be aware of this subject the law of torts now what is tort first of all i'll give you a brief introduction of what is tort tort the definition of tort is been given by many jurists and professors i'll likely to opt for the definition given by selman where he states that tort is a civil wrong for which
the remedy in common law is action for unliquidated damages and that is not exclusively a breach of contract breach of trust or any such equitable obligation so now by looking at this definition we get an overview of what is a tort first of all we will try to read into the ingredients of tort first of all it's a civil wrong first major point that means it differentiate itself from the criminal wrong so what is the major point of difference between a civil wrong and a criminal wrong is that in a criminal wrong or a crime or an offense you can call it whatever you want to in an offense <clears throat> the remedy to the victim is prosecution by the state and the person if convicted and accused if convicted is <clears throat> punished by the state but in case of a civil wrong such as a tort or we also have multiple civil wrong civil wrong such as the breach of contract so in case of a civil wrong or if a person suffers a, suffers a civil wrong from the hand of another person the remedy is that the <clears throat> affected or concerned person can approach the court for compensation or damages so under a civil wrong the person who is held guilty of committing a civil wrong will not be prosecuted and punished at most he will have to pay damages to the person who has suffered wrong from the hands of the accused or the <clears throat> person who has committed the civil wrong so first thing is this is the major point of difference it is a civil wrong secondly what is the <clears throat> remedy for civil wrong suppose a person a while he was walking on the street he was hit by a person who was driving a motor vehicle so now it is this act of hitting a by the person driving the motor vehicle is a civil wrong a wrong wrong itself in itself means breach of a legal right so in this case a person a he has a right that he should not be harmed by others so when a motorcyclist hit a so the legal right of a gets breached or violated so it is an occurrence of civil wrong now when a <clears throat> suffers harm because of the negligence of the motorcyclist what is the remedy for a as i have told you a cannot prosecutes criminal proceeding against the motorcyclist what he can do is he can approach the court for compensation and the court will depending upon the facts and circumstances of the cases will decide the amount of compensation so in case of civil wrong the person who has suffered the harm he can approach the court for compensation or damages and one thing is the damages should be unliquidated now what do we mean by unliquidated damages simply the unliquidated damages means they are not fixed by the contesting parties or in other words the unliquidated damages they are decided by the court now this factor differentiates the tort from a breach of contract i'll explain this in a <clears throat> within a few minutes so first of all what we have got is a tort is a civil wrong and the remedy for tort lies in action for unliquidated damages and now salmon has defined tort as being not a breach of contract 
he has specifically stated that it is not a breach of contract or a breach of trust or any of such kind of equitable obligations so one thing is tort is not a breach of contract the thing is breach of contract and tort both of them are civil wrongs but they are different category of civil wrong so now what does a tort or what factors differentiates a tort from a breach of contracts first of all in torts a person has right in rem or in case of a, a tort a person has right in rem now what do we understand by right in rem a right in rem means the person has a right against the whole world suppose <clears throat> a now we'll take the same example a he has the right that his body or his property should not be harmed by an act of somebody else this is the right and this right of a it is against the whole world that means nobody in this world can harm the property and the person of or the body of a but in case of a contract the right available is right in personam that means in case of a breach of contract the concerned party suppose we have a contract between a and b there are two parties there are two contracting parties now the b in this contract breaches its obligation or does not fulfill its obligation now <clears throat> a can only sue b in a court of law he cannot sue c he cannot sue anybody else than c or anybody else than b that means in a case of breach of contract the right that is vested in the contracting party is only against the opposite contracting party so in this case a can only sue for the breach of contract or for the compensation for breach of contract he can only sue b he cannot sue anybody else than b and secondly the major factor of or major point of difference between tort and contract is in contract the damages are liquidated damages that means the damages are fixed by the parties themselves so obviously you must have seen the contracts so in a contract there is a clause that if any any of the party any of the contracting party breaches its obligation in the contract he has to pay certain amount of compensation to the opposite party commensurate to the harm that is caused to the opposite party so the damages or we can say the compensation is already fixed by the parties themselves it is not left up to the discretion of the court so such damages are called as liquidated damages so this is basically the definition or we can say a general overview of the tort that it is a civil wrong and for which the remedy lies in action for unliquidated damages and that is not a breach of contract that means tort is something different from breach of contract breach of trust or any such equitable obligation breach of trust means what in simpler meaning in simpler words basically if somebody has been <coughs> provided with a property or somebody a, a property has been provided to someone and that person has the obligation of ensuring that the property is used for the benefit of the beneficial owner so as we see in the case of trust a creates a trust in which b is trustee and c is the beneficial owner so now it is an obligation on b that the property of the trust that the concerned property of trust trust should be used for the benefit of c because c is the beneficial owner <clears throat> or the beneficiary not the beneficial owner the beneficiary under the trust so now if b breaches its obligation it does not take care of the property or we can say he basically disposes the property property in a wrongful manner or he or he misappropriates the property for himself then he has committed a breach of obligation breach of trust so tort is not a breach of contract it is not a breach of obligation it is something different from these two civil wrongs 
so now in <clears throat> subject of thought we have a concept called as negligence in simpler words negligence means breach of a duty to take care breach of duty to take care i have given you an example that a is going on a walking on a street and is hit by a person who is riding a motorcycle b so when b hits a <clears throat> the legal right of a to not be harmed by anybody is breached and the b has the obligation b has the duty to take care that from his conduct or from his activities he does not harm anybody now b has an obligation that by his conduct or by his activity nobody is harmed or nobody's property is harmed so when b while driving on a street <clears throat> hits a so it is presumed that he has breached his duty to take care to not to hit a so this is a case of negligence but if b is able to prove in the court of law that he has taken all the reasonable precautions while driving <clears throat> so he might escape his liability so he will not be held guilty for negligence suppose in this scenario a was moving down the street and b was driving a motorcycle now in first case b was driving in a reckless manner or negligent manner so he was driving at a high speed he knew he was aware that the street is narrow that the street is congested and in spite of all this he was driving at a excessively high speed and he hits a so now b has committed a breach of duty to take care and he has committed an act of negligence but if suppose b was going down the <clears throat> lane on a motor bike and a was passing by he was a pedestrian and he was a, he was passing by now what happened was b was driving and suddenly his the wheel of his bike hit a pit sadak par gadde hote na obvious and that because of that hit the bike of b disbalanced now he was trying to restore the balance of the bike and in the meanwhile the bike hit a now we can say that the act of hitting a by b is also a breach of duty because he has hit a now the thing is though b has hit a or it is <clears throat> apparently seen that he has breached his duty of not hitting a but he has taken the reasonable precaution to not hit a he could not <clears throat> save a from hitting was the reason was basically the tires of his bike got stuck in a pit so under negligence if a person has taken reasonable precautions he can evade liability or he will be not held guilty of negligence but there is a concept called as no fault liability or strict and absolute liability strict and absolute liability the basic <clears throat> background or we can say the basic premise of these concepts strict liability and absolute liability is that if a person is indulging in an act if a person is doing something or if a person is indulging in an act which is inherently dangerous or the act has the probability or a, there is a possibility that act will cause harm to somebody else now the thing here is the person is indulging or person is committing an act which in itself is inherently dangerous and because of the commission of the act <clears throat> there is a possibility that that act will harm somebody else that will the act will harm the body or the property of somebody else 
so now in this case a person cannot evade his liability by stating does he has taken due care and precaution in committing that act now the thing is please listen so basically the premise in this concept the premise in the concept of no fault liability or strict or absolute liability is the nature of the act done by the person and because of that nature because of the act being inherently dangerous there is always a possibility that somebody will be harmed so in this case the person who has been committing or who has committed the act it cannot evade responsibility that he has taken reasonable due care and precaution in committing that act and despite him taking due care and precaution the <clears throat> harm has occurred to somebody now the doctrine of or the principle of strict liability <clears throat> it was developed by the court in 1866 in london or we can say england rather it was basically the case which happened in lancashire england england lancashire is a county in england what happened was there was a person who has <coughs> committed a uh, built a reservoir for the storage of water and he hired certain engineers for building a reservoir for the storage of water and for the purpose of building a reservoir the engineers have built certain shafts shafts hote gadde banaye the for the purpose of building the reservoir and <coughs> the reservoir was filled with water it was a sort of a storage tank now what happened was the water seeped through the shafts and it basically inundated the adjoining coal mines now there were coal mines and they were inundated with water due to leakage of water from here so now what happened is the coal mine got inundated and the owners of the coal mines suffered loss so now the owner of the coal mines sued mr a i'm taking an imaginary name for negligence so now a took a defense that he has taken due care and precaution while building a reservoir and despite in taking due care and precaution the water seeped and damage occurred to coal mines now in this case the court formulated the principle of strict liability the court said whoever brings on his land a thing that is likely to cause harm if it escapes a thing a person bring on his land a certain thing that is likely to cause harm to anybody if it escapes this person is committing an act on his own peril on his own risk that means now the court is saying while developing the principle of strict liability the court is saying if somebody is bringing on his land a thing which has a possibility that it will <clears throat> cause harm to other people or to the property of other people if it escapes the person who is <clears throat> doing the thing or the person who is bringing on to his land something dangerous he has the liability to compensate for the harm that is caused by that thing the person cannot take the defense has he has exercised due care and diligence while <clears throat> keeping that thing now in this case the person has he has basically stored water in his land so now there is a possibility that the water or we can say large quantity of water it will seep and it will cause damage to the property of others so the principle was developed 
<coughs> which puts a strict liability on a person and the person cannot take a defense that he has taken due care and reasonable precautions while committing an act so in this case the person who has built a water reservoir he had to pay damages there are certain exceptions one is vis major or we can say the act of god act of god simply means any occurrence that is beyond human imagination or foreseeability any occurrence that is beyond human imagination or foreseeability or if even it is under the <clears throat> nature of foreseeability or even if the person can foresee it it is of such a nature that the person cannot resist it kuch aisi cheez jo hamari kalpana se bhi bahar hai but agar koi cheez aapki kalpana mein bhi hai to wo itni prabal hai ki that you cannot resist it that you cannot stop it example is <clears throat> the natural calamities some uh, for example a hurricane happened there was a building and in building there were certain marketing posters or the <clears throat> now what happened was there was a storm a storm is of 100 km normally in that area there are not such storms of such magnitude but an unlikely event happened and the storm was caused and because of that that posters basically fell on the ground and hit somebody so now this is an act of god or vis major so now the person on whose building the posters or the placards were there he cannot be held responsible for negligence or another thing is if the plaintiff and the defendant in a particular case has a consensus of doing that particular act aur dono ne milkar sahmiti ke sang ek cheez ki hai now the thing is suppose in that case of the plaintiff and defendant had built a reservoir for their common uses and the reservoir was built on the land of plaintiff and the water seeps and inundated the land of the defendant now the defendant cannot sue plaintiff for damages because it has been done with the consent of and for the mutual benefit of plaintiff and defendant so these are the certain exceptions now in india what happened was how did this doctrine of how did this principle of strict liability got evolved into absolute liability in india as we all know in india there is no law of torts or we can say there is no codified law of torts i'll correct myself there is no codified law of torts like we have the codified law of crime we have the bns now we have the bnss bharatiya nagrik suraksha sahita but there is no codified law for torts so basically it is a common it is a part of common law or the law of torts is being developed through the judgments as propounded by the various judges in different cases in india what happened was in 19 84 there was a factory of shiram food and fertilizers in delhi and it was indulged in production of certain chemicals one fine day what happened it was not a fine day rather it was a unlucky day what happened was <clears throat> the oleum gas leaked it's a poisonous gas and when the oleum gas leaked it basically impacted the people who were living in the vicinity of that factory of shiram food and fertilizers limited now what happened was now <clears throat> the case went to the court and now the court has to decide whether the leakage of toxic gas from the factory of shiram food and fertilizer limited does it entails any liability under the law of torts now the question before the courts were because in <clears throat> the case of relents i think i missed the name the name of the case as that i have discussed earlier is relents relents versus fletcher in the case of relents versus fletcher the court has stated two thing that <clears throat> a person should be doing or we can say there should be a natural use, unnatural use of land and a thing must have escaped and caused harm to somebody else so to invite or we can say incur the liability or strict liability under relents versus fletcher first thing is there should be non natural use of land 
or now what is non natural and natural used it depends upon the facts and circumstances of each case and the concept evolves over the period of time and second is the thing must have escaped and there were also certain exceptions that are provided in this resilience and flexure so now was <clears throat> now the court formulated the doctrine of absolute liability and the case was mc mehta versus union of india decided in 1987 this court this case was of 1866 now in mt mc mehta versus union of india the court formulated an absolute liability and it stated that <clears throat> whosoever is indulging in an activity that involves a hazardous product whosoever is indulging in an activity that involves a hazardous product and <clears throat> because of the hazardous product a harm is caused to the people living in the factory in the industry or to the people living in the vicinity and if the harm is caused because of either leakage or blast or explosion of that hazardous product the the person who is conducting that activity he will be held absolutely liable he cannot take a defense that he has taken due care and precaution or he has taken reasonable care and precaution while operating the industry so in this case <coughs> shiram fertilizers or mc mehta versus union case the person was operating a factory of chemicals obviously it's a hazardous <coughs> activity and now the court stated because the person was involved in a hazardous activity that has a possibility of <coughs> doing harm to the people living in the vicinity now it is upon the person who is doing or who is running that industry that in future if any harm harm is caused because of that activity the person <coughs> or the person who is operating the industry he has to pay compensation to the people who are harmed by these hazardous products the court stated that somebody is operating a factory involved in production of hazardous products and he is making money out of it and so it is his responsibility to compensate those who have been harmed he cannot take a defense of reasonable care and precaution so in the legal jurisprudence of india absolute liability <clears throat> just i'm about to end the wind up the class it is a doctrine or it is a principle that has been propounded by the courts recognizing the need of the time and court in for the judgments have used invoked this absolute liability doctrine to pay compensation to the victims who have suffered harm due to the leakage of hazardous products or we can say due to any activity that is dangerous so now <clears throat> i'll end up the lecture here only i hope this video was informative so for more such videos please stay connected with lotus eyes thank you